Hello, and welcome to Fairview Baptist Church. I'm Pastor John Boyacek. I'm so glad you could join us in worship today. I trust that you will be blessed. You might have heard this story before, but customs officers at the border crossing into Canada and the States there, they... they Custom officers tend to have a certain sixth sense. These about, and they're suspicious about certain people as they come through. They, they just pick these things up. And, and a, a truck pulled up to the customs office, and the custom officer was really suspicious. His, his, his sixth sense is, is buzzing, and, and uh, he senses something's wrong here. And he orders the driver out. And... Uh, he, he looks over this, this truck, he takes the bumpers off, he, he goes inside, takes the seats out, and he looks and he searches the whole area, uh, trying to find out what this guy's trying to smuggle. And he goes, I just know he's smuggling something. And he looks and he looks and he looks, can't find anything. He says, you can go on through. A little while later, a couple of weeks later, same guy drives on through with the truck and he looks and he does the exact same thing. And and, and, and year, years go on like this. And this guy keeps driving the truck through and, and they look and each officer looks over and they take the thing apart, can't find anything wrong. And, and they know they're smuggling something, some, smuggling something, but they just can't put it down. And this uh, custom officer was finally retiring. And it was this last week. And sure enough, this so-called smuggler drives on through. He says, look, I know you're smuggling something. I, I know you're smuggling something, and I, I can't put my finger on it, but look, I, I'm, I'm retiring next week, and I will, not, I will not tell people what you're smuggling because you've just been bringing it all through all this time. Please tell me what you're smuggling. I know you're smuggling something. And the guy looks at him and goes, I'm smuggling trucks. Ever miss the obvious? <laughs> I, I, I find myself getting distracted more and more these days, with, and I miss the obvious. L last week, I, I was at a fast food restaurant here in town, and they have a really nice self-serve drink machine. You know which one I'm talking about. And I, and, and I go there, and I thought, I'm going to have a Sprite. And I put my cup in there, and I hit Sprite. And as I looked, there was raspberry Sprites and Grape Sprite and Orange Sprite and Cranberry Sprite. I, I had all these different options and nobody was behind me. So I said, well, what else is here? And I looked and there are all sorts of different flavors you could have. And I saw Mellow Yellow. As a kid in the States, I used to drink Mellow Yellow and I thought, man, I haven't had Mellow Yellow for the longest time. So I pressed Mellow Yellow and sure enough, it comes down and put it on my tray and I go and eat. And I... And I went to taste that mellow yellow, and I realized why I didn't like it anymore. <laughs> I went for a Sprite. I got distracted. And I got mellow yellow. <laughs> so many options. So many distractions. We can meet, miss the obvious. And, and psychologists say that... Uh, the issue why so many people these days are struggling with anxieties is because there's too many options and no satisfaction. Go to the drugstore. Get a simple product like toothpaste or shampoo. Which toothpaste did I use last time? There are 50 varieties here. What's my shampoo? What's it for? Was it for oily hair or dry hair or colored hair or what? So many options. People say, get an Apple iPhone and you get one and then say, no, Android's so much, and Android's so much better. No, the Apple 14 so much better. And then you go, which one's better? Or buying products made in China these days, the quality's so much better. It's inexpensive and it's decent, some people say. No, don't buy anything from China. They're communists. Don't do that. And, and you hear these voices going back and forth. You're destroying the earth by using carbon. Don't do that. But boy, look at that fast car with that big engine that goes really quickly. 
We, we, we talk about so many, we're bombarded with so many things. Instagram, YouTube, one voice saying this, one voice saying that, one voice saying this, one voice saying that. And, and we don't know which way to turn at times. There are so many options. And there's so much dysfunction out there too. Young people, what does a healthy relationship look like? And the world says it's this, it's that, it's go after these things. This is what's going to make you happy. But there's so much, so much dysfunction out there. And so in this world, we have so many distractions. How do we manage through them? Uh, Which way's right? Which way's wrong? Which way's healthy? Which way's destructive? Now, today, I'm not here to tell you everything that you need to know about that might, you might face in the life and all the decisions you need to make. But today, I want to give you some clarity, some help as we go through the many challenges that we all face in life. The greatest person who ever walked on this earth is talked about in this book. His name's Jesus Christ. And this book, I believe, is our guide, our survival guide to get us through this world, to get us through this life. And it tells us to how, how we can have life and have it to the full. It brings clarity. It, it brings understanding. It brings simplicity to our life. And so this morning, I, I want to talk about the narrow way. The narrow way. Uh, those of you who have been with me for the past couple of weeks, we've been looking in, in one book. But this morning, I want to look at it. In a different book, I want to look about some of the words that Jesus said in, in, in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 13 through 23. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. If you don't have a Bible, I'm going to put it up on the screen. Don't worry about it. But, but I, we're, we're people of the word here at Fairview. We love the word and we do what the word says. This is what I teach. It's not Pastor John's opinion on Sunday morning. It's, it's what the word of God says. And I'm going to talk about it today. And if you don't have a Bible, I'd love to give you one after the service. Come talk to me. I have free Bibles, free Bibles for anyone. Because we think it's the most important book. And we'd love to give you one. As Jesus lived on the earth, he saw the masses of people. And people run down. People at times hurting. People at times doing quite well. People at times being victimized. And, and he gathers them together. And he speaks to them. And and Matthew records one of the times when he gathered the people together on this hillside. And it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And and today, we're just going to look just at at a few verses out of that Sermon on the Mount. I want to talk about how how do we make it through this world? Jesus gives us three stories. Three stories I want us to look at today. Three stories, three, three warnings that I want to look at today. And, and it brings things into focus for us. And it shows us that there is a narrow way. So, is this working? It just seemed like it died on me. There we go. Um, the first story I want to look up is, is, is uh, verse 13 of chapter 7. It, it, it's called the narrow way. This is what it says. It says, enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrows the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Jesus was really good with word pictures. He liked to tell stories. And he says, hey, you need to enter the narrow gate. Simply find the narrow gate And enter it. Well, how can you tell which one's the narrow gate? Well, because there's another gate. The the other gate is the broad gate. The one with the major road heading up towards it. And and, and many people are on it. And in Jesus' day, going from city to city, you would go into a city and around the city would be a big wall. And there was a major gate that would go into those big cities. And as you head on up to that major gate in those big cities on these Roman roads, all around you on both sides would be people stopping you and saying, excuse me, excuse me, can you buy some of my product here? I I, I got some fresh vegetables here. Why don't you buy some, some fresh fruits? Other people would be coming up to you and say, you know what? 
I've been victimized and I need justice. Can you help me with justice? Other people will be coming up to you and saying, I'm starving. Can you give me some money so I can get some food? Other people would be coming up to you and say, you know what? I got this great business venture for you to join in. Why don't you come join in as you're going along the road? Distractions, distractions, people distracting you along the way as you head into the big cities. In one way, Jesus says, yeah, there's this broad road. Many distractions are on it. And, and he says, don't head that way. Instead, look for the small gate, the narrow road. And he says, only a few find it. Get the picture here. There's so many people just heading down that road, kind of head down or just looking at the head in front of them and just heading in that one direction, uh, kind of marching with everybody else. And Jesus says, no, there's, there's another way to go. And, and you need to find that way. And he says, there's a better way. Jesus talks further about this in other passages of scripture. In John chapter 14, verse 6, he says this, and he makes this claim about himself. A, a very important claim. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, the narrow way is following after him. The narrow way leads to life. And it's understanding how he is the way, the truth, and the life. The narrow way. Another thing that Jesus says is, he says, I am the gate. Who enter, whoever enters me will be saved. He says, he, he's the way. He's the truth. He's the gate. He, he, he's, he, he knows what's on the other side. He gives eternal life. And so many people are going down that broad road, following the, the person in front of them, not giving it a second thought, not thinking about life, not thinking about the purpose of life, the meaning of life. And, and, and there are so many, so many people telling you what to do these days. Um, for instance, the mantra that we hear from childhood is what you need to do is get a good education. Why do you need to get a good education? Well, because so you can go to uh, university. Why do you need to go to university? Well, so you can get a good job. Why do you need to get a good job? So, well, you, so you can make money. Why do you need to make money? Well, of course, so you can get married and have a family. Well, why get married and have a family? Well, why work and get married and have a family? Well, so you can eventually retire. And then what happens after that? You die. It's life just doing one thing after the other, after the other, after the other. Getting a little bit richer, having a family. Is that that's all that to life? Or is there more to life? And Jesus says there is. And so he says, look for the small gate. He says, find that narrow road. And the world has its voices calling us. us that, and so many people say, this gives meaning. This gives purpose. And the road that is wide has many good intentions on it. But they're leading to nowhere. And Jesus says that the road that leads to life, only a few find it. Are you on that road? Have you found that road? The passage goes on. And he talks about... Watch out for false guides. Look out for false guides. In, in verse 15, it says this. Watch out for false prophets. I'm going to put it up on screen here. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly there are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? Or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Jesus says here, you know, watch out. Use your eyes, also your ears, but watch out. Uh, there are false prophets. There, there are false teachers. There, there are false people who are, who are saying, this is the way to go. And it is somebody who tells you which direction to go in. And Jesus says there are many false prophets out there, false teachers out there. And he says, we're kind of like sheep. 
You and me, we're kind of like sheep. We, we, we follow the shepherd. We, we, we get lost at times. And we follow a leader. I heard the other day, somebody told me this, that if you're a farmer with 100 sheep, and one of those sheep get out from your fence and get into another uh, field, and you have 100 sheep, how many sheep do you have left in your field? Zero. Because sheep tend to follow another sheep. They all, if one gets out, all hundred get out. That, that, that's the way sheep work. They, 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 they follow a leader. And they could be the dumbest leader out there, but they follow a leader. And many times we follow the latest and the greatest thing out there. And Jesus says, watch out. There are wolves in sheep's clothing. And I, now, most of us don't have sheep. And most of us don't really see wolves around sheep these days. But I think you get the picture. Wolves eat sheep. They devour them. They destroy them. And Jesus says, there are people out there that want to destroy you. And not just your life here on this earth, but also your life for all eternity. Make sure you recognize them. But he says they're tough to see. They're tough to see. This this is how you, you recognize them. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Think about that for a minute. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Uh, Many of us think we can spot a fraud or a fake right uh, uh, out on on the get-go. But Jesus implies that most of us really won't. The the way you recognize a fraud, the way you recognize a a crook is by their fruit. And to see their fruit, it usually takes time. And he says grapes taste a lot better than thorns. Figs are much sweeter than thistles, but it takes time to see those fruits. If you follow a certain person, what is their outcome? If you follow a certain teaching, what is their outcome? What does that look like? And and there are many people out there who are deceived themselves, and unfortunately, they're deceiving others. There have been a lot of fast-talking people out there that deceive people so often, And if it sounds good to be true, it usually is. You know, if you invest with me, I'll give you 25% within a year from now, and you will be a rich person. Invest. Give me your money. Give me your money. And people give them their money. And then a year from now, the cops are chasing after them because nobody's getting their money back, let alone the 25%. We've, We've heard stories like that. You can go on the internet and find all sorts of interesting teaching but you need to ask yourself, what's their fruit like? What are they producing? Oh, it sounds good on the internet, but what's their fruit like? What's their track record really like? What is the end product like? Oh, they look good, but what's, what does the end result like? There's a new sexual revolution going on these days. Be what you feel. Do what you feel. Do you what you want to do with your body and celebrate it and don't let anybody hinder you. Is that producing healthier relationships? Is that making families stronger? Is our society better for it because of these, this new sexual revolution? What, what type of fruit is it really bearing? But Jesus says, follow my teaching. I bring life. I bring eternal life. I bring hope. I I bring a future. I I bring meaning and purpose to life. And and, and I want you to prosper now in this life, but I want you to even more so prosper for all eternity. In this life, I want you to have honesty and trustworthiness. I I want you to put you into a community of people who care. I I want you to have an avenue where you can deal with your hurts and your struggles and your hang-ups and your challenges that come your way and the sorrows that inevitably, inevitably come into your life. I want to help you with forgiveness. I want to help you with those tough relationships. I want to give you life and give you life to the full. That's, that's Jesus' teaching. Some of you might be saying, you know, Pastor John, that's nice. But there are some people out there that claim to be Christians. And and look at all the hurt that they caused. Sexual abuse, financial fraud, all done in Jesus' name. And Jesus said, yes, there's there's going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. But he says, everyone who does not 
bear good fruit in the end, they'll be cut down and thrown into the fire. They'll be dealt with. And my, my heart grieves when I hear things done in Jesus' name that Jesus would never, ever do. It makes me so angry when I hear those things happening. And, and I'd want to see those people punished for the evil that they have done because that's, that's not the Jesus of Scripture. They're not living for Jesus at all. They're a wolf in sheep's clothing. So Jesus says, watch out for those false guides, those false prophets. And, and then the third story that he tells us is this. He says, do God's will. And this is an interesting passage in uh, verse 21 through 23. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about uh, eternity here. But only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoer. Jesus is saying that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, or Jesus, Jesus, will enter heaven. But he says, only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. The question is, what is the will of God the Father in heaven? Jesus said, some people will say to him, Jesus, didn't we do really good things here on this earth? Like, didn't we tell people to follow after you? Jesus, didn't we do, have some great miracles happen, like cast out demons? Like, wow. Or even see some miracles happen because of using your name? Amazing things that these people have done. And Jesus says, I don't know you. Away from me. You evildoer. Ouch. Ouch. So many people think that getting into heaven is about doing good things. And it seems like this person did some really, really good things. Get him into heaven. So what's Jesus getting at here? Two main things that stand out in the passage. Uh, one is, uh, he talks about the one who does the will of my father in, who is in heaven. He, that's, that's one thing. What is God's will? What, what is it that we need to do? Secondly, he talks about you evildoer. Let's just talk about depart away from me, you evildoer. What was it that was so evil that this person did? After all, he did some really good things. We need to ask that question. What makes a person? Many of you might say, well, there's a lot of evil people over at the super jail in town here. Those are evil people, murderer, thief, liar. Um, th those people are evil. But what Jesus is trying to get at here is the reality is we're all evildoers. Even if we really do good things like save the planet, help the poor, victims, give to the needy, needy, be the nicest person. Even if you do many, many nice things, we're still evildoers. Um, we're born with a bent towards evil. No one had to teach you how to lie. It came naturally. Nobody had to teach you how to cheat. It comes naturally. Uh, nobody had to teach you how to get angry. Nobody had to teach you how to, how to deceive people or even... Uh, Want something that's not yours, um, even lust. Nobody had to teach you any of those things. We have a bent towards it. We're, we're born with a sin problem. And that's what the Bible calls sin, the things that we do against God. And you and I cannot get rid of those things on our own. Now, unfortunately, that sin causes us a separation between us and God, which makes us an evil. So let's agree that all of us, including me, are evildoers. We have something that we have done against a great and holy, pure heavenly father. And that's a problem. That's a problem. But here's the solution. He talked about us being evildoers, but the solution is the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Well, what's doing the, the will of my father that is in heaven? Well, what Jesus is talking about here is a little bit hidden 
It's really unpacked further within the story within Matthew here. But the fact is Jesus lived a perfect life. He, he, there was nothing in his life that, that was a sin against God, his heavenly father. And the day that he went before, before he went to the cross, he was in the garden of Gethsemane in the night. And he was praying to his heavenly father. And he says, heavenly father, I, I know what needs to be done here. I, I know what needs to be done for the sins of the world to be taken away. But if there's any other way to do it, can we look at that? If there's any other way, so, so I don't have to go through what I have to go through on the cross. Is there any other way? May that, may, can we look at that? And the father says, no. Jesus, you have to go to the cross. Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus willfully went to the cross because he knew he had to. The reason why he came to this earth was for one main pur purpose, to, to show us how to live, but to go to, to the cross to pay for my sin, to pay for your sin, so we are not seen as evildoers. And he went to the cross and he conquered sin. He took the sin of the world on his shoulders. And he paid the price because death had to happen from a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus was perfect. A price had to be paid for my sin and for your sin. And Jesus took that on the cross. He conquered sin, but he also conquered death and he rose from the dead. And he gives us a way to a heavenly father. He gives us a way to get rid of this evilness in our lives, this sin. And only Jesus can deal with that sin. No one else can. No other religion can, can deal with sins. Some people say, well, if I only meditate more, that'll get rid of my sin. No, it doesn't. Or if, if I just, you know, chant scripture a little bit longer, that will get rid of my sin. No, it won't. Or if I do a lot of good things, like so many, many, many good things, that'll get rid of my sin. No, you still have sin there. It won't get rid of it. Only what Jesus Christ did on the cross can get rid of the sin in your life. And so Jesus says, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Confess your sin to me and I will give you life, life to the full. And so the way that you can have your sin dealt with is through prayer. It's by asking Jesus to take away your sin, realizing that he died on the cross for you, realizing that he's the only one who could take your sins away. And he, he gives us a way to God. So you can say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. So, sorry for what I've done. I know that you've come into this world to show us how to live. I commit my life to you. Take away my sin. I want to follow after you today. And if you Say a prayer, something like that. If you mean it from your heart, he'll come into your life. He'll do a transformation. And you start on that journey of following after Jesus. You heard Elmer's testimony. He did that when he was a kid. He's such an old guy now. But God, God's, God's done a great work in his life throughout, throughout his, his life. And God's used him in some great ways. So three stories we looked at today. Find the narrow way. Are you on the narrow way? Look out for those false guides. Are you following some false guides out there? Some false teachers out there? Uh, look to the true teacher, Jesus Christ. And do God's will. By, by following after Jesus Christ. By having your sins dealt with. By, by heading on that discipleship path. Following after Jesus. Getting to know who he is and what he's all about. And so Jesus said, enter that narrow gate. And watch out for those false teachers. Whose voice are you listening to? There are so many voices out there. And they want to give us some simple instructions, but they really don't promise what we need. Trail Magazine has about 30, uh, 37,000 readers. And it's the most widely distributed climbing magazines. And on February 2004, that issue provided directions for climbers descending Britain's highest peak called Ben Nevis. Any of you climbed it before? I, 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 I haven't. I've never been there. Um, 
Uh, and, and returning from the 4,409-foot summit in bad weather we, requires explicit instruction. And as you know, in Britain, it's usually bad weather. It's always foggy there, right? And so this article gave some step-by-step -step advice on navigating the trail down. But the directions were wrong. 37,000 readers got the wrong directions. Roger Wilde, who is the Mountain Safety Advisor for Mountaineering Council of Scotland, discovered the mistake, mistake and he immediately contacted the magazine. And he wrote, the potential consequences of following the advice provided by the Trail Magazine are clear. Anyone following a bearing of 281 degrees from anywhere close to the summit carm or shelter will be taken directly over the north face. I find it incredible that Trail has published advice which is so obviously and dangerously wrong. And those uh, following the article would pay a high price for the missing information in poor visibilities, climber depending on those off the edge of Gardley, Gardley Lou Gully. And that's that thousand foot drop off the side there. You see that one? It's kind of straight down, thousand, yeah. It, it's one of the longest drops in Britain. 37,000 readers with directions like that, it would take them to their death. They need the proper map. They need a proper compass to navigate the way through. Not those simple wrong instructions from that magazine. And Guy Proctor, the ed editor of Trail Magazine, said that the problem had been caused by a production error. Their simple explanation, a sentence was missed from the article. A correction would be placed in the March issue, so don't read the February issue. And Mr. Proctor said the trail advises that all climbers use an ordnance survey map and compass. Anyone looking for a map could see what's wrong and hopefully it will be picked up by the readers. So many people giving the wrong directions out there. Jesus says, there's a narrow way. Jesus says, I'm here to give you life and life to the full. And you need to follow after Jesus and following after his teaching in his word. That's what we're here about. And I'd love to talk to you more about this. If, if, if Christ is knocking on the door of your heart, surrender your life to him today. As Elmer said, he went home and he surrendered his life to Jesus after he heard about the gospel. It's my prayer that you do that even here. Surrender your life to Jesus and start following after him, being one of his disciples. And some of you getting off the narrow way. You need to come back. Come back to the truth of Jesus and his word and follow after his truth that gives life and life to the full. Let's pray, shall we? Lord God, thank you for the way that you're in the business of transforming lives. Thank you for some of the stories that we heard today about how you have touched lives and you're working through lives and, and you give us meaning and purpose to get through this life and help when the challenges come our way. And Lord Jesus, I, I pray for, I thank you for the people who are here today. And there are some people who, are, who love you but have been wandering, wandering and looking at that wider road instead of looking for the narrow way. I pray that you'd help them to get back on track and follow after you. And there's some others here who really haven't looked for the narrow way, haven't really put their faith and trust in you. Lord Jesus, in my prayer that you'd be touching on the door of their heart and saying, let me in. And they would surrender to you and you'd do a transforming work in their lives. Lord, thank you for this church and how we're about the business of doing what you want us to do. And would you continue to allow us to encourage others to do that? Uh, thank you for this time together that we could worship you through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad you're able to join us today in worship. If you have a need, a prayer request, feel free to reach out to us at the church here. You can give us a call or you can also email us. God bless you.